when I was at BlackRock, I got promoted for a job a bit early, and I was up against another girl for it. Mm. And she told everyone that me and my boss were sleeping together. <gasps> That's messy. Oh, that is, that is so messy. messy. And I, I was like, how old was I? I was 25. It felt like my world was like crashing. Over. That was a moment where I was like, that is rough. Like I would have thought we would have been supporting each other. You know, they say women shouldn't be bossy. We're out here reclaiming that word. What's so wrong with being the boss? Bossy. Welcome back to Bossy. I'm actually really, really excited for this episode because we have my friend Lindsay Dorf here to talk uh, about, well, we're going to talk kind of about like flops and just the trials and tribulations of business and the way Tara talks about it, that bop. That entrepreneurial <laughs> boxing match the that, boxing we, that match. we stay in. The roller coaster. The roller coaster. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we're going to talk about that today. And as always, we don't want it to be just like us peppering Lindsay with questions, but just a group discussion and kind of adding her as a third co-host to the mix. So I want to give a little background intro on Linz because she's like one of the most impressive people I know, frankly. She's like ex-Black Rock, ex-Google, Harvard Business School, just like you name institutional prestige and there's like a check mark next to Lindsay's check. name which is just like the complete too nice the complete opposite of my journey <laughs> but it's giving badass she's a badass she really is and she's just like a very graceful founder so she's I am an advisor for her company Aster Money and it's kind of the first time that I've got to have that like up close and personal watching someone build something zero to one and just the way you navigate all the challenges of it like you are so you just don't you never seem like you get like rankled ever you're just very I definitely do well I've never seen it I've never witnessed it even amidst like the really kind of crazy tough stressful elements of it because I mean that's like yeah. what what it is half the time so I mean I have a lot of things that I would like to talk about, fundraising, like hiring, how you're getting talent, like yeah. those things that are stressing you out right now. But in general, I think it'll be a fun convo just to talk about like when things go wrong and how we deal. Yeah. So there's this thing on social media that's like there's a lot of popularity around this. It's called like a Canaan event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Canaan event. Canaan I event. haven't seen this. OK, so essentially <laughs> it's just like a really bad thing. I think I'm saying it right. Canaan event, a yeah. really bad thing that happens in your life like someone like passes away you Oof. lose a job like there's like a whole catastrophic thing that happens and it changes kind of the course of your life but you kind of have to go through it to get to the other mm -hmm. side mm -hmm. I think probably like, there's a couple of them in my own life like definitely getting laid off for my job at Microsoft which felt like such a like terrible thing at the mm -hmm. time which now I'm like thank goodness because I like learned so much from that process I'm curious if you can think of like some of those points for yourself yeah. I mean, personally and professionally, I'd say they're different. Yeah. From a professional perspective, I mean, almost every week, I think you have one of these moments where... The many ones. The many yeah. moments where something happens that you didn't expect and you just have to figure out how to navigate it. I think the hardest one for us over the past year was probably going through fundraising. Mm -hmm. So we had... Well, I started this company... Uh, and I'll share a little bit more about Aster. Yes, yeah. I would love um, to do that. But I had started this company in business school. So I was getting a joint business degree and an engineering degree. Yeah. And See, we, had, <laughs> we had <laughs> different competitions in school where you could fundraise. Yeah. And so we had gotten about 200K to get the business off the ground. Great. And then we hire an engineering team. We start building. We reach a point where we think we're ready to raise our seed round. We have a product that's going out the door. We have about 100 test users. The and how long are had looking that good. taken? It had taken about a year. A year, okay. From ideation to raising the funds to getting the team to getting, like, an initial alpha out the door. Great. Um, we go to market to raise our seed round, and we realize, like, the market we thought it was is not the market anymore. This was in May of 2023. Oh, yes. Mm. So the market was changing a ton. We're building in consumer fintech. Yeah. So it was a hard place to be building in. What was the market before and what was the market now? Like for people who are maybe not in the fundraising process or like in totally. tech or in this space, what, what was the shift? <laughs> well, so I'll, I'll explain what we were walking into. To raise a seed round, they said you need to have 20,000 users that are like actively using your product. Mm -hmm. And that's your seed round. Yeah. And before it, takes, it was like... 
Do you have an idea on a Google Doc? Exactly. Amazing. We Here's are five million dollars. <laughs> we're out of that phase though now. Like so many people think like, it oh, I can so raise much. money. Yeah, it's not. We're not there. Okay, so you walk into this different market. So we walk into this different market, which, in hindsight. I should have done a bit more research the months leading up to it. Like every month you need to be on top of like, what is the market changing into and what are you looking at? Um, but we, we go into fundraising and I'm trying to raise between like two and $4 million. So this isn't like a big seed round. This is like an average yeah, or maybe even reasonable. smaller seed round. And we have in May, maybe 40 meetings. Yeah. You get so many no's, so many. Mm -hmm. And when you're interviewing for a job, <laughs> you're not doing 40 interviews. Mm -hmm. Like, we're just not used to, like, getting mm. 40 no's in a month. Yeah. So just then the humans are not, you don't No, I mean, even when that. you're, like, dating, it reminded me so much of dating. Yeah. Like, sometimes you get ghosted. Um, there's just so many pieces that are parallels. But, um... And then they say maybe and kind of drag you on. And you're like, is it maybe or is it no? I don't really know. But maybe it is maybe. So you like, think exactly. you need to follow up. But it's And a this no. is where it reminds you of dating. Because it's like mm -hmm. you sometimes get to know the other person, the yeah. investors. You're like, wow, we had, we clicked. Mm -hmm. We had like some magic. And then yeah. you get that like a long email, <laughs> you know, after four meetings that is like, we're just not yet, you know. Four meetings. So, yeah, I think going through fundraising and getting those no's initially and being like, in order for this business to survive, like, we need money. Mm -hmm. And at the point where you, like, have this initial alpha product, there's so much that you need to figure out on how to convince someone. Because it's not like you have all of these crazy metrics and, like, all this crazy growth. Like, figuring out how to get uh, acquire customers when you don't want to spend money on it is hard. Yeah. And so I would say for us, or for me, the hardest moment was handling those no's and being like, all right, how do these no's help us look at the product differently and yeah. figure out what we need to change and how do we use these conversations as research? Because every person I'm talking to is or knows this market super well. So how do I use this to help the business? How do I use this to make us stronger instead of like coming home and being like, I just got rejected yet again. Yeah. Can you, before you go up, jump into like the rejection of it all, because I do want to talk about I that. I have a couple follow ups. Can too. you just quickly just catch everybody up on what Ask Money is and how yes, the product, like just please. give us that context so we're yeah. really clear on that. Yeah. So we are building a personal finance platform for women, um, which is why Katie is one of our amazing advisors. And the way that we do it is our core focus is to grow confidence investing, which was a massive problem we saw. I think mm -hmm. the metric was like 90% of people we spoke to said, I want to be more confident investing. Mm. And what we found is people are most confident investing when they know what people similar to them are doing with their money. Okay. So when they know different investment strategies, they're like, okay, I've seen this person, you know, buying single name equities or purchasing these ETFs or using this robo advisor. Like these are the strategies. This is what works. And this is what I'm choosing for myself. Mm. And a lot of these more social investing platforms are very focused today on what's the next GameStop? Like yeah. what's that one stock I want to buy? And Instead, we wanted it to be more of like, how do I benchmark myself to people similar to me? Mm -hmm. How do I get like a really good understanding of what I'm doing? Like, what is my return? What is my allocation? What is my risk? And how do I compare that to someone who has a similar income, similar net worth, similar life scenario to me mm. to see what's working and what isn't? And so we weave in this social piece in a very approachable way. Got it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I was going to ask if that why was part of the fuel that helped pull you through all the no's, kind of your deep belief yeah. in the product and in the need for it. Definitely. I mean, you are in that moment, and so many very smart people are saying to you, like, no, like, I mm. I don't believe you can acquire customers cheaply, or, um, like, there's so many people who have tried and failed. Like, what makes mm. you different? And you really need to believe that there is a problem here that you can figure out how to solve um, and that you're the right person to be doing it. But, yeah, I mean, in that moment, you have, and I'm sure you felt the same, like, you have a ton of moments where you're like, can we do this? Yeah. Like, yeah. can we solve this problem? And you have to really want to solve the problem and feel like, it's your job to be solving it to like power mm -hmm. through in those moments. The other thing too with investors is it's not just like 
you have to realize too that it's not them saying I don't think that you can do it. Totally. It's more so that like first of all it's not even their money. They have investors of their fund, yes. usually, unless you're yes. talking only to angel investors. Were you talking only to angels or, like, funds? We were actually only talking to funds. To funds. Okay. Yeah. So with a fund, that dude that you're talking to, it ain't his money, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody else gave him totally. money. And his it is his job to make himself look good with what he did with that money. And yeah. he has a bunch of people come, and I'm saying he because, like, it's very often a dude. Unfortunately, yes. What percent? Yeah, do you know? Meetings. Have you ever like sat down and been like, man, I've, it was? I don't, I don't know the exact percent. I want to say, I, I don't know. I read it recently that I think it's like less than seven percent of VCs are female. Yeah, I mean, just mm -hmm. of your meetings that you had. Oh, for our meetings. Yeah, for your meetings. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> do you remember anyway? So I would say about eighty percent of our meetings were with male VCs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say we met some incredible female VCs, yeah. uh, but the only investors that we have right now that are actual funds, so we have one or two female angels, but all of our VCs are male right now. Like our lead investor, who is incredible um, and, and believes in our mission, was at our event last mm. night, is male. I just want to say sometimes it's harder to get the women on board. I think so. Outside of angel investors, like once you're in, like I find I have found this from investors and also just like job interviews. Like my experience when I would go to a job interview was like if there was a black woman, for example, on the mm -hmm. other side of the interview interviewing me, I'm like, oh, I'm definitely not getting it. Why? Really? What are you saying? Just because for? I think you have like that person works at a company where they're probably the only one or a few of the only one. They're only woman, yeah. the only person of color. So they've like you're a reflection on them, and so they got to be extra, extra like toughness dialed up and they're really looking at like I think it just is sort of a thing that happens but I think sometimes like at least in my experience my biggest allies in business and people have helped me lean towards being men over women and it's like an unfortunate I will say it's the same for me yeah, the worst really. things that have happened to me in the workplace have happened from women Wow. And the dudes, like, shame. the ones that are good, they will really champion me. They'll be like, hey, thank you for inviting me to the panel, but, like, I don't see this being a very diverse panel. Like, here are some people to call, and if you get them on board, one of these people on board, then I'll also come. Like, women are less likely to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some studies around how, like, when you feel like you are wearing that role and there can only be one woman yeah. there, then you feel like there's more competition. Yeah. against the other women and so yep. it's important for all of us to look at that and say like we're not going to fall into that there can be so many of us mm -hmm. um yeah it's the yeah. there can only be one phenomenon which yes. yet yeah, you see that in a lot of marginalized groups yeah. i think which is Crab exactly totally. how you've described this competition or like being accepted e x c accepted versus accepted a c c accepted yes. it's like that's really interesting though that's that's like uh, frankly kind of like disappointing to hear like I'm like having a moment where I'm like that really makes me sad um I have <laughs> had some amazing female mentors mm -hmm. yeah. um we're probably going totally off topic here but um when I was at BlackRock I got promoted for a job a bit early and I was up against another girl for it mm. and she told everyone that me and my boss were sleeping together <gasps> Holy smokes. It was like my first promotion, like kind of like out of line, out of like the normal promotions. And um, that's messy. Oh, that, is, that is, so is messy. messy. And I, I was not. like, how old was I? I was 25. It felt like my world was like crashing. Over. Yeah. I will say BlackRock did a phenomenal job handling it. Wow. Phenomenal. Um, made me like really proud to be at that company. Um, but yeah, that was a moment where I was like, that is rough. That I would not have thought this happened from, like, I would have thought we would have been supporting each other. You would think. That that could have been yeah. another, like, business flop, b workplace flop experience. And yes. It sounds like it didn't. You, you got saved, maybe, from that one. I did. And it was, I think it was a, I will speak very highly of BlackRock. I will speak very highly of my manager. Yeah. Because he did not, you know, shy away from teaching me more and, like, spending time mentoring me. Yeah. which I think was my biggest fear in that moment. I was like, now that this is going around 
am I going to be kind of like exiled? Yeah. And he he really helped me, and he was the one who really brought me into product. So yeah. um, the company handled it well. I have one other remaining question, though, about fundraising, which I think is interesting, because I can imagine someone listening to this and going, okay, I'm about to go into a round of fundraising. Like Lindsay said, that I should be researching every month, like what's going on in this market. What are you reading to do that research? Who are you talking to? Like what does that process look like for you? That's a great question. I think the biggest thing is you have to talk to people in your network. Talk to people in your network. Yes, okay. and read. There's a ton of great newsletters. Um, for me, the biggest thing is finding people who work in the space and being like, all right, to raise a seed round, what do I need now? What is it still 20,000 okay. users? Um, do I need like X million dollars in revenue? Mm -hmm. Like what is it that I need? Um, yeah. And just talking to people, I would say, is the best way to do it. Okay. We There's so much in business and entrepreneurship that there is no published report on. You are not going to find it. It ain't there. And like people, e even people aren't talking publicly about it. You have to like get in a room and just like one-on-one, -on -one, like tell me a little bit, like you have to ask poking questions to like get to the totally real. Suss out the, to suss the hot it. gossip yeah. about what's going down. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. I, I also think part of it is as much as we can say like, all right, there are these metrics that like you are expected to hit, there are al always outliers, always. Yeah. So there's, you know, certain people who can walk into a meeting and like exude this crazy confidence when there's not even a product out. And there's other people mm -hmm. like myself where I can really believe in the mission and really believe in the product and know we're going to get there. But exuding that type of confidence that someone else might be able to yeah. without, you know, having it in front of me is just harder. Yeah. And so, so much of it is personality. So much of it is bias. So much of it is metrics of course um but early stage you know i think it's the whole package mainly not metrics i actually think early stage investing is mainly vibes can you make I, that person yes. <laughs> wish that they were you when you like when they were your age if they can live a little bit vicariously through you that's what you're selling mm. actually you think yeah Hmm. Do you like are you like do you make them cool like so much of it is like cool currency We invested in the cool company like so much of investing is a mm -hmm. social game We want to invest in something that's cool. It's gonna make us look good and also like oh, yeah Like I want to like cause, you know that person oftentimes was like goofy and nerdy in school And so like <laughs> are you cool like so much of that like when you see the people who win in fundraising They're able to like deliver this vicarious thing But I, I wanted to ask you about this like flop that you were talking about about like your your Canaan event or maybe yeah. one of them because I'm curious about how you handled it. And the reason I'm thinking about this, just to tell you a quick mm -hmm, like yeah. story about this. So my boyfriend sold his first company. He's actually sold a couple companies, but he sold a company that was like a big sale for him, and he sold it to S.C. Johnson. Mm -hmm. And when I met him, he was telling this story as a failure story. Like, he was like... How so? Right, right. He was like, you know, because he didn't get the, like, Pay, the exact payout that he wanted mm -hmm. and so and uh, there was sort of a lot of like drama that sort of happened mm -hmm. around it like we know that like when this these sorts of deals happen there's a lot of stuff that happens right and one day I was like why do you tell this story like it's a flop story mm -hmm. like when I hear this story it sounds like a win a dub you sold your company to Etsy oh, Johnson like a <laughs> fortune 500 company like why do you keep telling it this way and I think he has this like he has this like strong moral obligation in general in life and so I think he feels like obligated to say like when it's not all rainbows to like say it directly yeah. right which I understand but I also understand that like every win every flop story has a win on the other mm -hmm. side of it like there's no only flop story but you could choose to see it that way yeah so I'm curious for you about when you think about your own flops like how what do you do afterwards to sort of like lick your wounds and also do you eventually see it as a win and a flop or does it always just exist as a flop in your head one of my like life philosophies which has helped me to date I don't know if it will help me forever <laughs> is that things happen for a reason yeah so as we were going through those meetings and not getting like the initial yeses that we wanted it did help us go back to the drawing board and say, you know, there are things we are learning in these meetings and things they are pointing out that like we need to dive into a bit more. Mm -hmm. and so we took some time to dive in and ended up pivoting our product to focus a bit more on women. So a lot of, you know, finally making that decision did come from a lot of, you know, the conversations we had. Yeah. So for me, I think one of the things we have to keep doing when we're starting 
companies, any type of company is reflecting. Like we get caught so often in this wheel of like, I'm behind, then I'm working too late, and then I'm falling behind on everything else in life and then the next day starts and we're not like stepping back and actually reflecting on what is the problem we're solving are we solving it the right way and like how do we get there in the most efficient way yeah and so for me taking that time we took we ended up taking like two weeks after may to like repivot relook at the research think about these conversations um did you cry first did I cry? Oh my gosh, if you asked my boyfriend. I think I cried like once a week, honestly. But I'm also a crier. Like, I love I to am cry. Too. What's I your am sign? Too. I'm a Virgo. Okay. So is my husband. Yeah. What's Aww. your sign, Katie? Capricorn. You're a Capricorn. I'm a Cancer. I'm a crier. Ooh. So we're all criers. Regularly. We're I all love criers. Cry. We should cry together. That should be a segment <laughs> of this show is just weeping. This is the weeping <laughs> segment that we've entered. I'm curious, you know, you mentioned, I think it's like, I'm really homing in on the fact that you said all of these no's, we're actually learning something from them. Because most of the time there's a long email that accompanies it that's telling you yeah. why it's a no. Yeah. Are there any examples you can think of or like themes that you pulled out that you then were like, oh, okay, I actually didn't see this before. Just I'm, I'm curious if we can like press on that a little bit. Yeah. So when we originally went out to the market, our product was fully focused on investing. So... Yeah. You linked your bank and brokerage accounts. You were able to see your annual return. You were able to create groups of people and track your return versus them um, or follow individuals. And that was like the core of the platform. And a big learning that we heard from um, a lot of investors was we just we, we think that there needs to be more in the cycle, like more in the cycle. Okay. You have this journey and it's like you figure out okay this is what someone's doing but it's like well now what mm -hmm. like now how do they learn from that mm -hmm. and so you know how do they then have a conversation on the platform how do they create community which is part of why we're doing mm -hmm. different events um what if someone you know is already not investing like how do you get that person also on the platform so how do you help them figure out it is the right time to invest so there were you know some investors that got really into the product with us which was mm, awesome yeah and that was you know we were already getting some of that feedback so it was a time where we we're like all right let's you know go back to some of the initial initial research we've gone and like relook at that i would say the biggest thing that we've heard from investors is the fear of customer acquisition okay because customer acquisition acquisition costs in consumer fintech yeah. are so high. They can be in the hundreds. And when you are a pre-seed seed company, you don't have hundreds to spend. And so figuring out how are we going to get this product in front of our target audience in a really cheap way yeah. was something that we you know, needed to sit down and like really create a plan around. Mm -hmm. Katie, you were telling me earlier about like a flop experience that you've had yourself. Oh boy. <laughs> Can you share, if you're willing to, I'm yeah. like putting you on the spot yeah, here, but yeah, like, yeah. can you share this? Well, I love that you're focusing on the learnings. I think I also took a big learning from mine. Mine was very recent. Yeah. So fresh. <laughs> I, I basically had the opportunity to interview this person that I really respect and they, they're like Pulitzer Prize winning. Like they're, they're like respected in all the ways that I someday want to be respected, you know, like mm. working on very important things and like, sorry, you will be. Oh, Lens, love you. <laughs> no, but like, you know, working on really important things, very accomplished as a writer, just like, they were that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had this interview plan. I, I like did a lot of research before the interview to just make sure that all the questions I was gonna ask them were really, really spot on and like really indicated that like I was familiar with their work and respected their work and so I'm excited for this interview. So I send the production document ahead of time and I say, okay, this is what we're gonna talk about. Like, I'm so excited to talk to you. And they noted one line that I had written in the beginning of the production document that effectively admitted that like I had not, I, their book was on my list, but I had not read it yet. You did all this research, but you just didn't read the book. I had not read the book. Yeah, okay. And I'm not sure if it came across that I had done other research or if they just saw that line mm -hmm. and were like, wait a second. And so they initially, like an hour before the interview, they were like, hey, wait, so like you haven't even read my book. And I was like, oh my gosh, 
-hmm. that I, I was just trying to set the stage that, like I hadn't read it yet because I had just learned about it more recently like that was the only reason so it was like a big miscommunication and how I had like conveyed but I think they took it as a sign of disrespect and we kind of went back and forth a little bit and they were like I just don't think this interview is a good fit so mm. I'm like mm. kicking myself after the fact because I'm like now we not only have I like insulted this person that I massively respect completely inadvertently but also now we have to sh I've inconvenienced my whole team because now we have to like either find someone else to interview mm -hmm. or like you know we now have to reschedule this episode and like make a new plan for this episode because this person is no longer going to be with us anymore mm -hmm. and I was just really it it sucked on multiple levels and it did ultimately come to the conclusion where like I was apologizing profusely and they're like it's okay it's okay so like me and this individual are fine. We don't have like beef now, but it it was just a moment of like, the learning that I took from that was that you have to be very, very careful about moments where transparency or frankness might come across as like, like you just don't know how someone is gonna perceive these mm -hmm. things, particularly in these yeah. interview situations where like you are for all intents and purposes, spotlighting them in their work. Like I will never write an introduction Mm -hmm. in one draft ever again you know <laughs> yeah. what i mean i was just like okay but it's a good it's a good learn learning experience it's it's i'm happy that it happened now and that like i've now gone through that but it was mortifying but you know what i yeah. hear when i hear that story like that story sounds like right now you told it as a flop story mm -hmm. but i can also imagine that being the start of a story you tell about how you just like significantly right after that skyrocketed all of the amazing interviewees that, like you got even mm. like higher like yeah. that now i'm on this world stage like that sounds like the intro oh, yeah. to like this crazy success story and so this is why i'm saying there's like these like there's a win Duality. version and there's the flop version of every story like steve yeah. jobs got kicked out of his mm -hmm. company right he's started apple they kick him out yeah. he starts another company he started pixar no, no it, was a different company. it was uh oh my gosh next. next 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 we all thought of it at the yeah. same time next and then like they beg him to come back right you could tell that story is that i flopped and got kicked out or you could tell that story as like a full circle like oh you needed me yeah. you know how i love to do that too is in my head y'all listen to how i built this yeah i Roz. you know how he always gets founders talking about their flops i will sometimes put myself in that imaginary interview situation <laughs> to reframe the moment in the moment i'll go yeah well you know i this happened and i felt terrible but it taught mm -hmm. me that this and so then what happened next was kind of to your point about yeah. it's the beginning of the story we'll reframe it in the moment to almost talk about it yeah. like it happened in the past it's like a weird little mental hack but i'm so used to listening to those interviews that that's like the narrative arc that my brain will take that's now an amazing arc because of that and it's in the moment, though, I'm like, with someone on the other end of it whose feelings I just hurt, I'm like, oh, my God, cry. Like, yeah, <laughs> of course. weep segment. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was gnarly. Sometimes we feel, like, obligated, though. I think, like, as women, we feel, like, more likely to be sort of, like, apologetic about a yeah. thing. Just, like, I think we just, are, like, socially conditioned that way. Yeah. And so we feel like, oh, I've got to, like, tell the flop version of the story. Like, the, the like, yeah. oh, no, I could reframe it and, like, still tell that part, but, like, share it as a win and position it as a yeah. win, like, is hard for us. So I'm curious, Lindsay, like, do you feel personally the obligation to tell stories as flop stories or as flop then win stories? Hmm. I think when you want to be real and authentic, yeah. which I feel like that word is said so much, but if you just want to be honest about what you're going through, like starting a company is a roller coaster. If I just sat here and I was like, it is so fun, it is so rewarding, every day is like yesterday. Like, <laughs> it's not true, you know? It's a lie. So, like, actually, I'm getting beat up over Yes, here. and so when yeah. people ask you, it, it is an interesting balance because you don't want to just be talking about the good things, which there are so many. You don't want to just be talking about the bad things because then people like there was one period where people are like, why are you doing this if all of this yeah, stuff is happening? Yeah, yeah, and you yeah. demotivate your whole team if all you talk totally. about is the bad things. They start to get. But like, you also want to be transparent with everyone. And so I think for mm. me and for our team, it's definitely a balance of how do we be real about what we're going through yeah. and what's great, but also, you know, what's hard and. That way, no one's caught off guard. So, like, when we were going through struggles with fundraising, there was, you know, a few months where I said to our engineers, like, we're going to do a little bit of pivoting. Like, if you guys can be on hold right now, 
we're not going to be building. And they knew we were fundraising. Like, they knew what we were going through, so it wasn't as big of a surprise as it would have been. Yeah. I mean, no matter what, that conversation is hard. Yeah. But... But I they, think it's you, they were along for the ride. Yeah, I do have. I want to ask you about hiring too, because you um, you have done something that has been kind of amazing to watch from the outside looking in. I think we could all learn from it. You have gotten such impressive talent, mm -hmm. and you're not working with millions of dollars. You can throw at these no. people. No, I would love to hear your approach to this. My personal belief is if you can hire someone that someone you know has worked with before, it always makes it easier. Yeah. Okay. There is so much that you can figure out in an interview, but it only goes so far. Mm -hmm. So most of our team has been built from a connection of a connection. Gotcha. So okay. when, we, when I started Aster, um, I had met a designer at my previous company and I called him up I was like I have this idea like start working with me this was before we had any funding he's still with us today he runs our design and he is in Poland he had been doing design for 15 years wow. and we started building when it came time to hire engineers he was like I have this army of engineers I've worked with that I think are awesome like connected me to them got on the phone with them um, and that's kind of how everything moved from one step to the next so for us, it was really how do you use your network mm -hmm. to hire? And then what are the core things that you look for in those interviews? And I think the one thing that is really important to me, especially at this stage, mm -hmm. is passion about the problem we're solving and passion about building something from zero to one. Yeah. And as long as I can find someone with that energy, that drive, that excitement, I know that they're going to be a good fit for our team. Mm -hmm. How big is your team right now? There are three of us full time. Beautiful. And then we have, it ranges depending on the month, but about four or five contractors. Yeah. Okay, good. Got it. Okay. I, I was asking that because I think like once a company starts to get to a certain size too, we we're just talking about like sharing the transparency of yeah. everything. There are some people who can really handle knowing all of the highs and lows are kind yeah. of like maybe they're not the entrepreneur themselves or the co-founder themselves but they're like if you join a team with three people you know what you're signing yourself up for right totally and then you, should. you sh well yeah you should <laughs> you're right <laughs> yes correct maybe you don't though maybe maybe it's your first time like we're all figuring totally. it out as we go yeah. but i do think there's sometimes people who on your are on your team who maybe cannot handle that kind of high and low with you and start to feel demotivated around it. And so like, I hear a lot of my founder friends like talking about like how much transparency is too much, too little, just like Which is real. It all. Yeah. Because I think as the CEO, it's on you to wear that. Like you, yeah. you are the one who should wear that anxiety and that worry. Yeah. And being transparent with your team is important, but if everyone is wearing that, mm -hmm. I don't know that it's productive. No one business. gets anything done, and then it yeah. starts to like spread like a cancer through the organization, totally. and everybody's demotivated, which is like that does nothing. No, Do so you kind of have to hold you, some of it. You just hold yourself and like cry in the pillow. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 To yeah. your friends. Keep it to yourself. To it your parents. Yeah. To whoever it is. Not at the company. Mm -hmm. Dang. Yeah. yeah. It's a responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing that too, because I think it's just been. You've also gotten people from other big fintech companies, mm -hmm. which has been interesting to watch that you're able to lure these people away with your vision, which I think is why I am confident that you're going to succeed in this. Thank you. Is because you are getting, you're making the right calls. Like you're getting these, these very talented people mm -hmm. from companies that, big name unicorn companies that have done this before that have yeah. pulled this off. Like it's really, really inspiring to see. So I know that it's a, it, it, is a roller coaster, but that feels like a high point from the outside looking in. Definitely. No, I think I think most of the moments are highs. Like mm. you are building something every day. You're seeing reward. Like you see people using it. You see people getting joy out of what you want them to be getting joy out of. And yeah. so there's so many high moments. Um, but it's a roller coaster, mm -hmm. for sure. One of the things we talk a lot about on this show are like muses or like people that you look to and you're like, I mm. love how they do that. I love how they handle this. Like, I would like to be able to handle things similarly. Are there are there any people in your life? And this is for like both of you. We can sort of mm. like collectively mm -hmm. talk about this. Like people in your life, who you're like, oh, dang, I like how they handle things, the highs and the lows. 
Hmm. Katie, you kick us off here. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm. Can we do like I a like thinking how they moment. handle the highs and the lows. Yeah. This might be a bit of a cheating answer, okay. but I do think you're somebody like that for me because uh, I, I do watch you d- navigate some of this stuff. And we've had very frank conversations about like what needs to happen in the next yeah. six months in order for you guys to get more runway and keep going. Mm-hmm. And it is it's like sometimes I don't think I fully grasped how do or die it can be yeah. when you are like the, the, the end of the runway is over there and there is a timeline that we're going to hit that in and like mm-hmm. if these things don't happen before then we're done yeah so yeah but when I said I've never seen you be wrinkled I mean like that's a very high stress situation and I think you do do a good job of keeping a, a solid baseline so I'm actually kind of I'm glad you're here that you're my example because I'm like <laughs> yeah. how do you think you do that I think a lot of it comes from learning. Okay. So the first time you go through, okay, we are running out of runway. Yeah. And by runway, we mean money. We, yeah. We we are running out of money to pay the team. Yeah. And we need this money. Um, I think I definitely wasn't as calm as I will be the next time we face that. Yeah. And so I think a lot of it is muscle memory. Like Mm -hmm. everything feels like the biggest deal the first time you do it. Like the first time you have to fire someone, the first time you're running out of money. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like I'm breaking up with, you know, my partner. It's everything is so big in the beginning. Yeah. And then you do it once and you're like, okay, the world didn't end. Yeah. And then when the world doesn't end, you're like, you look back and you're like, I wish I didn't bring myself on that roller coaster. Like Mm -hmm. how could I have been you know, more calm throughout that journey because the world didn't end. The roller coaster is optional. It is. It is optional. It doesn't always feel that way. But it is. It really is. You can step right off of it. Yeah. You could step off of it. You'd be like, let me off the ride. But I I want, if people are just listening to this and they're not watching it either on Spotify, you can watch it, and also on, on YouTube, I'd love for you guys to see Lindsay's like poisonous like she's I would say right like, cool is the <laughs> That's word the that, word cool yes. is the word I would use to describe it. and I don't even I like I mean cool like you are cool but there's like a coolness <laughs> like, like cucumber a calm, cool. cool like cool <laughs> like a cucumberness about you that is very CEO like thank you it, I mean I don't think there are definitely moments so yeah. like this week you know we launched our product yesterday join our wait list download our app yes. um and there were moments where we were finding little things. And if you saw me on calls with my team, you might not have saw that same cool behavior. It's a bug. Um, There's a bug. Yeah, but <laughs> but I, I think intensity is necessary in this role. Yeah. But um, being level-headed is the most important. Yeah, that's the interesting balance, right? Because you, you really have to infuse your team with energy. Yeah. That energy comes from you. Definitely. And also, you got to be super calm so you don't panic everyone. And, like, when do you do each one? Like, you've got this good balance of this, which is impressive. I'm working on it. Yeah. I was going to... Katie asked you when she was like, how do you do it? And I was curious, do you feel like you do it? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think walking in here, I would have ever said I was, like, calm, cool, and collected. Really? Yeah. It's giving I'm unbothered energy. No, no, no. Poise is the perfect word. Poise. It really is. But you don't necessarily feel that way. On a scale of one to ten, how poised do you feel like you are? Five. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Then I'm a negative three. No, not at all. If you're a five, I'm in the negatives. (laughs) But I think we're always our toughest critic, right? Definitely. We film this show in batches, so we do, like, multiple in a day. And I had the conversation the other day with Katie about this because in between a meeting, I had to let someone go. And I came back, and Katie was like, what? You just did that just now? Like, and I was very calm about it because, like, I've got enough reps in. Yeah. That, like, and I panicked about it enough. Yeah. And, like, I freaked out about it enough that like I now that similar insight that you just said about like oh why was I tripping about that like it it was okay that person was like actually like I I saw this coming like I think you know like maybe it isn't working like and I'm like okay great like but I think you're a really great person I want to help you find the next thing and like thank you so much and it was good vibes and so after I had enough experiences like that and learned how to do it I was like oh okay like I don't need to be freaked out every single time but at the beginning you freaked out Every time something goes wrong. I do want to just shout out to that piece you just said about I knew this was coming. Anyone who's like, how would they know? The scorecard episode is like 
I think, such a good listen if you haven't heard that one yet, because it's a... Uh, I think the reason this person knew it was coming is because you had predetermined and quantified what success looked like, and success mm. had not been happening. Yeah. So it's like, it wasn't a surprise. Mm. Someone said to me, I don't remember who gave me this advice, so, like, shout out to whoever did, but they were <laughs> like, if you let someone go and it was a surprise to them, that's your fault. Yes. Exactly. I love that advice. Poor management on mm -hmm. your end. You didn't give them any feedback. You didn't give them the opportunity to yeah. shift it. And sometimes, like, when I was starting entrepreneurship, I'd be so shy about giving feedback. Yeah. And I couldn't hit someone straight with, like, let me tell you a couple things that are working. Let me tell you a couple things that are not working. I just couldn't hit the feedback in. Mm -hmm. And, like, I could see how people were just floundering and str Like, I was making people's job harder because I couldn't hit them straight with feedback because I was scared. Yeah. And so I had to, like, grow out of that. So now if we have to transition something, and that could be well, your, your moment of, like, we're running out of money. That could be a transition. The other transition could be, like, performance-wise, like you're not performing well. Either way, I should, like, let you in on some context of that. And the more senior the person is, like, closer to working with me, the more I think that's important. Yeah, I like that. What is your feedback style? Ooh, what is my feedback style? I'm now pretty direct. I do the, like, superpower kryptonite framework. Mm -hmm. So I hit them with a couple things I love that they do first. Mm -hmm. And then I share some feedback with them. Now, I would say with my friends, because my friends and I are really good at giving each other feedback. We just go straight to it. So my friends would be like, can I tell you something I'm seeing right now? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? Fine, hold on, hold on. Let me get myself ready. <laughs> what? And then you, but I know they're gonna say something really insightful. And like, I see like you're in a little bit of a limiting belief right now. Mm -hmm. Like, here's what I'm like. There's a voice in your head, and like, as my friend Rachel says, like, and I want to smack her because like she's not. She's like oh, off track right here. Like maybe think. And I and I know to take that feedback on and be like, even if it doesn't resonate, I go like, okay, let me sit with that. Yeah. Mm. Um. When it's my team. I am so that's how I like am back and forth with my friends with my team. I'm pretty straightforward on like saying here's what I think is maybe not working, mm -hmm. but I wasn't when I started. Yeah, it was messy and like I would say like something on the side of this is like my pet peeve now when someone says something on the side of the feedback instead yeah. of right on the feedback <laughs> because it results in like if someone's messing up. And they say the feedback on the side, so the person doesn't get the feedback. Mm -hmm. They just keep flopping. Yep. Like yep. they had a flop, and then they just you just let them keep flopping because they didn't understand the feedback because you were being like tiptoeing around it. Yeah. So, yeah. Just let them keep flopping. You, just, you let that person flop. Totally. I uh, I want to introduce a, an external an external piece to this conversation. Okay. Just a little listener question. Yeah. That I want y'all's feedback on. Okay. I have some thoughts, but I'd like to hear from you guys mm -hmm. first. The question is, and I'm going to include the praise because that's my love language is words of <laughs> affirmation. So I'm loving this show so much. Thank you. Me too. Feel like I've been brainstorming a brand in business for years, but I've been so stuck in getting started. I'd love to hear some about the early, early days of transitioning ideas into starting something tangible, going from an audience zero to even just 1,000. So I'm going to assume audience that this is someone that's like thinking about like content creation. Mm-hmm. Mm. But we, we should broaden just in case because that's not the situation everyone's going to be in. I feel paralyzed not having it all planned out. Mm. I know what you're going to say. I'm going to be quiet. So let me go, Lindsay. Okay. I wonder if we're going to say the same thing. The paralysis of feeling like it's not all planned out. I don't know how to start. It's the first. It's the, I'm, I'm at zero. How do I get to get to one? I don't think you can have it planned out because if it's all planned out, it's all your bias. So whoever this is, I would they say... They were anonymous. They were yes, anonymous, this anonymous yeah. person. Um, you need to do your research. So mm -hmm. I think, like, you start with an idea, whether it's in the content space, like, what is the niche that you're going to solve or mm -hmm. be a part of? If it's a product, like, what is your hypothesis? And then you have to do your research. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important thing is getting in front of your potential customers and learning from them. Yeah. And then from there, you figure out like, do I have enough to start building or do I need to keep doing research? So I think for me, like the most important person, the most important thing this person has to do is their research. And do you consider getting in there. front of customers to be research or that's something different? That is exactly what I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is the research. So talk to people. So I think- You need more information. Yeah, I think you have to do market research to figure out like, okay, does like the market align with what I think this problem is? Hmm. But 
then you have to actually speak to customers mm -hmm. and see what they're saying and see what they're feeling because there's so much you can read that doesn't actually translate yeah. to the world. And so for us, we've spoken to thousands of people about how they manage their money. And the takeaways we have, we would have never found from just reading or it's so different from what we originally wanted to start out mm -hmm. as. Yeah. So I think spending time, like as much as you need, talking to people and learning about the space and learning the pain points, that's free. Like mm. you can find people in many different ways. How do you find them? Like if you're gonna talk to, you said customers, but it could be customers or if you don't have any customers, potential customers, yeah. like ideal customers, but maybe ideal they're not a customer yet. Yeah. But like, how do you find them? I, I think it depends on the space you're in, but yeah. you kind of just need to like reach out to people cold in the beginning. Yeah. So if there's something you're building for, like who is that target persona? You find that target persona through social media, through your networks, whatever it is. Or yeah. go where they are. Yeah. Like, I'm totally. immediately imagining, like, I'm picking a manufacturing product because I think digital is too. I'm trying to put myself in a different set of shoes. But, like, if I'm trying to develop a skincare product, maybe I'm going to go to Sephora and Target yeah. and, like, stand in the skincare section and, like, observe what people are doing. how people and be like, hey, I noticed you're, like, looking at that. Like, have you ever used it before? What do you think yes. about it? Like, go to where those people are. Yeah. That would be my first instinct. And then, like, cold email someone who writes a skincare blog and mm -hmm. talk to them about what they're hearing. There's so many people that you can reach out to that have spoken to your customer. Mm -hmm. And so... I love that. Free. That's a good, that's a good. I, I also have an experience with that that I want to share because it might be helpful. Yeah. When I was trying to figure out how to launch a course, one of the things that I did was some ideal client research around like, who do I think needs this help and who am I trying to reach? And to your point, Tara, always about basically like, if you want to target people that have a high, um, high willingness to spend. Yeah high willingness to transact. They've got a lot of money to spend and you know, what is their problem? Particularly at the beginning when you're starting Particularly something. Particularly at broke. the beginning yeah. when you're trying to, you know, you need to find people that are willing to spend money on something. I have this theory that like there might be a lot of people out there that are making a lot of money and have no idea what to do with it just because I had heard that from people that read my posts and podcast. And so I interviewed a friend who was making a lot of money, a lot of money. And I was kind of like, I, my assumption is that this person, because they're so smart and they're so savvy and they have all this money, that they already know what they're doing with it. And when I interviewed her, she was like, oh no, I just have like hundreds of thousands of dollars in a savings account. I'm like, no, I have no idea what exactly. to do with it. And it was this huge unlock. Mm -hmm. And so when we did like usability research or user research for when I'm back was when I was a content designer, a, a, like a user experience writer, we would only ever talk to five people. We would get the product in front of five people mm. and have them go through it. And those five people, that was kind of like the magic number in, in, in you know, just like usability testing where you're trying yeah. to, you know, it's not a big thing, but you're trying to get uh, initial feedback. And that's kind of like the sweet spot where like you're going to hear themes if you're talking to five people, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting piece of that field that I was like that kind of surprised me. But I don't think that you have to talk to. It's not like you got to go talk to thousands of people. No, you know no. what I mean. It it can be a handful, and you're probably going to immediately start to notice the trends. Yeah. And when you're having those conversations, one other great piece of advice I was given is at the end of that first conversation, ask that person, "Is there someone else you know who's dealing with something similar?" Yeah. And have them connect you. And that's an amazing way to keep doing research. I also love the question: Is this something you're willing to pay for? 100%. Can I get you signed up? Yeah. Because those customer interview questions, like I always like see people in a customer interview and they're like getting all this feedback and the person's like, yeah, 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 they're, they're excited. And I'm like, why are you not selling? Mm. Yeah. Why are you not getting that one sign up right now? Yeah. And so there's an opportunity to sell, like actually in the question that was written into us, it says going from an audience to zero to even to a thousand. And Katie assumed it was a content business. I hope it's a content business because if it's not, we don't need audience. We need customers. Yeah. Definitely yeah. not audience. That's and so true. thinking about it, maybe that shift and you just need to start getting get get one to start. That's yeah. All. Let's yeah. make the implicit more explicit there. Yeah. If you're talking, if the person who wrote this in or who maybe like or someone listening to this is thinking about it like audience, 
you're thinking about marketing when, as we've said in the past, you should be thinking about sales. If this is not content creation, yeah. Yeah. it's not audience. Yeah. It's not marketing. It's not, it's not positioning. It's yeah. selling. Even sometimes when the, the business is a marketing related, like content related business, like I think even in your scenario where like you need, maybe it's not like a super high price point for the app use or the download, mm -hmm. you might need at the beginning, like I'm going to do a version of the product that's a little bit more hands on that we start like to charge a high ticket price for so we can get people on board and like really hands-on and doing something in detail and also get some money on board and then we're going to expand it to something that's more content based or something more like low price point based yeah so that you can get some revenue show the traction like get things going yeah i'm curious Tara, if you got any mindset thoughts here because it seems to me like the analysis paralysis of being stuck in the idea phase yeah. is a mindset thing and i feel like you have <sighs> You probably have a, pr a perspective. You might not, I do. You might not like it. <laughs> I, I think I think this just like needs a courage sprint. Like, I do not have it figured out either. None of us do. So if you're waiting to like feel like it's figured out to start, like you're that's not that's not the game of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Go do something else then if that's what you're you're looking for. And so I think though the way you do it is you go. I'm about to do something. I have no idea if it's gonna work. I'm going to a lot an hour and I'm going to do all the things that Lindsay just said about like reaching out to people, like having those conversations. This is my hour where I'm going to do it mm -hmm. and I don't get to second guess or judge it. And like once you do that a couple of times, you're like, all right, like I'm going to just get the work done and like you'll get into the role of it. But like maybe crafting out these periods of time where you get to just like turn off all second guesses, all analysis paralysis, because like businesses start by you doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And that courage sprint that Tara's talking about for the audience, we did an entire episode about this type of like confidence building courage sprint with Rachel Rogers. So yeah. if you've not heard that one yet, that's a good one to listen Either to. Either it's already out or it's coming. Yes. We'll see if you want to dive deeper, yeah. if you want to dive deeper, that's a good one. Perfect. Well, I think okay. this is a good place to wrap up our conversation. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys for having me. This and was for fun. gracing our, our fun couch. <laughs> and being vulnerable with us about yeah. like the highs and the lows. Always. Yeah. Truly. Thank you guys. Thank you.